Um, basically, the way your tour is going to run today, I am going to take you straight to the platform. I'm going to put you on a train, and from there, that train is going to take you all the way up the White Pass and Yukon route railroad track and you're going to land in Fraser, British Columbia. Once you get into Fraser, Michael is going to pick you up at the top. Okay? Right. And then he is going to take you to the Yukon you Suspension you, Bridge. Uh, it's a beautiful little spot where there's a, a whole bunch of really pretty Real things British. to see. They've got a good meal for you there as well. Um, so all of that is a wonderful experience. And then following that, ladies and gentlemen, um, you will go all the way up into the Yukon territory where you'll get a nice picture of their welcome to the Yukon sign. Michael is going to be a, you're going to have a great time. I love Michael to death. He's worked for us for a couple of years now and um, I just think the world of him. And then once you're finished there at the Yukon sign, he's going to bring you down the mountain back into Skagway where you will conclude, what is it, seven hours is the tour duration. Um, so you're going to have a great time, I promise. Now, before we get too far, is anyone thinking this is not what I paid for? <laughs> okay, I mean, even if you had, I mean, you're you're in a really good spot and you're accounted for, so it's going to be a great tour anyway. Brian, McKelsey, what's your location? Brian, McKelsey, what's your location? Now, ladies and gentlemen, one thing that Michael may not tell you is currently, right now, we are entering the red light district here in town. Uh, uh. During the Klondike Gold Rush, uh, prostitution was a thing. And it was a big thing. And uh, they tried several times to produce city ordinances to cut down on the amount of prostitution. In the end, they realized that they weren't going to get rid of it, so they may as well just confine them. And they turned all of 7th Avenue into the red light district. I'm sorry, but I think we might need to pull those people out. Copy, thanks. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this building directly in front of us, this is what's known as the McCabe College. Okay, the McCabe College was the first all-women's institution in Alaska. It was an all-women's college. It lasted about two terms and then uh, fell into disrepair due to financial difficulties. Nowadays, the front half is our Skagway Museum and the back half is City Hall. Now, does everyone see this train up here in front of us? Yes. That is your train. Okay. So here's the plan. What we're going to do is we're going to pull in, and I'm going to hop off the bus, and I'm going to go talk to the train uh, manager. His name is Jake. He's a good guy. Uh, his job is to make sure that everyone has a seat on, um, on this train. So what I need you to do is gather up everything that belongs to you. Okay. This is farewell for me. Now, do you remember who your what your bus driver's name is? Michael. Michael. Do you remember what bus number? One five zero. Five zero. That is correct. Blue. So uh, yeah, and it will have a I believe a blue or a gray interior. <laughs> All right. So like I said, I'll have you just sit tight for me for just a few minutes. Um, I'll get that uh, information that I need, and then I will fill up the last little bit of paperwork that I have. I'll give you some last second instructions and then we'll get you on your way. Sound good? Yeah. Yes. Beautiful.
time of year, we're going to see a large clearing in the trees. And we'll see an unparalleled view down into the Skyway Harbor. Some tour guides just simply call it the view. Now, once again, a couple pictures of those. Look over your left hand shoulder, and you'll see the Denver Valley once again, but this time from 206 feet in elevation.
the hat. Yeah. All right.
my left hand side here will be, will be the subcontinental divide between the United States and Canada, marked by a bronze obelisk. It's going to be sharply up your left hand side. You're going to look up pretty far above the train to see it. It's a bronze obelisk that separates the two countries of the United States and Canada. Now, all the water that was flowing against us up here, like the Skagway River, now the Thompson River will be flowing with us. Once again, this is sharply up on your left hand side above the train.
Okay, we should have everyone inside and seated. great that it's not snowing today and that there have been times I've seen snow up here in June so well, good 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 okay well as we're continuing to make our way up, um, through this area I know they've talked a lot um, while you're while on your train ride about the gold rush as well as about the white pass and the train itself um, so we'll just kind of continue on with uh, a bit of that narration and if there are some things that uh, I may say again that you had heard before, maybe you just need to remember them a lot more for the quiz at the end of the tour. Just kidding. I'm just training to be a teacher, so that's why I'm not handing out quizzes. Don't. I don't hand out quizzes. I'm not that. Because you're here on vacation, not for school. <laughs> but over here on our left hand, our right hand side, sorry, is a shallow lake. And it is uh, part of the Finger Lakes uh, lake system throughout the entire Tormented Valley that you've just gone through, such as Summit Lake, uh, Lake Bernard. And these, the special thing about each of these lakes is that they're all fed by glacial runoff. And uh, you will get a lot of glacial silt in these lakes. And so they can create these really beautiful colors that uh, that come from the silt. So some of that glacial blue uh, mixed in with some of that glacial brown. So, can, so there's uh, certain times of the year that it can be a turquoise color within these lakes. So it's a really pretty area. Now just ahead of us are the Two Shy Mountains. And Two Shy is actually a clean-up word or a First Nation word that means dark in color. Um, and so even on a clear, sunny day like this, even from a distance when there's no snow on there, they do actually look, actually look pretty dark. Now you also may have noticed as you were coming up by train that you go through three, or that you go through a few different environments. So down in Skagway is part of the Tongass National Rainforest that extends all the way down to Ketchikan and basically covers all of Southeast Alaska. And up through the Tormented Valley is where we have a sub arc.
about the history of the Bolt Rash. Um, so I'm sure you all got to hear about Dead Horse Bulge when you're coming up on the train. And uh, that was a, that's a very, very tragic and sad story. Uh, oh, you just like think about, yeah, sometimes you don't want to think about how all of those horses that would have been just stripped there, dead. Um, but there were some good stories that came out of the bull rush as well. Um, it's good to also to find that little glimmer of sunshine um, in the midst of darkness. And one of those is actually um, about a woman named Harriet Pullen. And she had actually come up to Skagway to uh, just kind of try her business skills. And she had come to Skagway with $3 in her pocket. And she would actually bake pies and sell them to each of the prospectors as they were um, preparing to make their way up through the White Pass. Now she would actually sell her pie, her, a slice of pie for about $5 a slice. Uh, she would also serve it with fresh cream with, from her cow that she had brought up with her. Now today, the equivalent of $5 in the late 1800s would be about oh, 130 US. So that's a lot for sure, but uh, after you've been traveling for a long period of time, it's nice to actually sit down and have a home cooked meal. Um, and also, by having that fresh pie, um, it helped the prospectors ward off scurvy because they didn't have ready access to fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, they started to become prone to scurvy since they weren't getting the vitamins that they needed. And so they, so that was actually Adrian, who actually actually got so much that he started giving it away. I wish I was around at that time because then I could just be like, yeah, I'll, I'll use this in a few years when I go to school, <laughs> almost a whole century later. Um, and uh, yeah. And there were stories like that that just kind of boggled my mind, that just someone would have so much gold that they would just give it away.
and over here to the left is Tagish Lake, which is named after the Tagish people up through here. There is a pretty amazing and interesting culture in regards to the First Nation people here in Southeast Alaska and this part of Canada as well. Um, let's see, now you've all been to Sitka, right? Yes. Okay. And did any of you get to go, because I actually spent a week in Sit or some time in Sitka last year. And did any of you get to go and watch the native dance? Yes. Oh yeah, that was one of my favorite ones. Did anyone actually go out and dance with them? No, maybe. Uh, that's the fun part, though, is when you're like hobbling and around like you're a girl. But uh, but it's amazing just the culture that uh, you get in those areas. There's not so much in Skagway because most of the uh, natives up within this area actually lived over in Dai, um, and hardly any of them were over in Skagway, um, unless it was to like maybe fish or, or maybe a few other things as well. But you had the Chilkoot people, uh, which I, if I'm remembering correctly is a moiety or basically a tribe and teaching license. Um, and it's just really interesting to see how languages work and interact and how you know they, they can thrive and then they can die as well. I realized I forgot to point out um, when we were stopped here at Lake Tushai. Um, did you notice how quiet and peaceful it was through here too? Oh, that was actually so nice when I stepped off the bus and I'm like, oh, so, so serene. Um, and that's one thing that's also nice about coming up here is that you really just get to take a break from everything that you have going on because there's hardly any cell phone service up here. And there's fresh air, clear, yeah, you know, fresh, clean air, beautiful views. That you really can just kind of take a break from everything that you've had going on. themselves right before leaving 
And it's really interesting because you can actually see a lot of convic conviction and determination in their eyes. And they're just excited to go and get up and see the Yukon and to find as much gold as possible. But as the story progresses, and as you continue to read through the pages, you find that they get to Skagway and they're, they're pretty much shocked because they weren't planned, weren't ready, nor were they expecting everything that they would be going through. And for a lot of them, this really would actually be their first time being out in the wilderness. And because a lot of them just had no, no idea what to do or what to expect. And so that kind of adds to the tragedy that came about because of the gold rush is that since you had a lot of men and women that had no idea what they were getting themselves into, uh, they did come across some pretty dire times. Which was one of the reasons why the Canadian Mounted Police did check and make sure that you had no less than 2,000 pounds of goods just so that if you were to run out, then you wouldn't steal from someone else. Um, also, there were a few other native villages along the trail, and they didn't want those villages to be ransacked or to have those, vill those villagers give up everything that they own. Um, now, along the trail, they actually did uh, decently well, like even though they didn't have any official law, um, if you were caught stealing, they would actually uh, put a pole in the middle of camp and if I'm remembering correctly, they either would just leave you there, or they would whip you. And that was if you ended up, were caught stealing uh, from someone else's stash. Which, I mean, for those that stole it, that was actually pretty easy to do. Uh, because a lot of those prospectors, especially along the Chilku Trail and even here, and the White Pass, uh, they would actually have to make close to 20 trips up and down certain areas in order to get all of their items up to that top. And they would actually uh, need to put close to 10 foot posts or poles to uh, mark where their items were uh, because the snow would actually come up and cover where their items were. And so it would have been really hard to find if they didn't have those posts. The plant that you see growing along the rocks here, that is actually known as a caribou moss, uh, which is actually a lichen. So it's not a moss, it's a lichen, uh, which is a combination of algae and fungi. And it actually starts to live on these rocks and they start to break the rocks down, which would eventually create wrap create um, cracks in the rock and start to create more of the topsoil so that the trees can come and seed and start growing here as well. Now also at the far left you can see the Sawtooth Mountain Range. And here up, up on our left hand side as well you'll be able to see a few features that uh, were created by the glaciers. And these are called glacial cirques. Now, you may be like, well, what exactly, what exactly does that mean, Michael? Well, those glacial cirques are created when a glacier that is sitting on top of the mountain peak actually starts to dig into that mountainside and it creates this bowl shape. And it uh, leaves what is called a horn, which is the highest point of that cirque. And you actually have a few of those along the uh, mountains here to our left. Or that will be on our left here a little bit. But it's also really neat to see that transition between the environments um, so you can actually see how valleys like this eventually start to become like the valley that we had just left further up closer to the Yukon Territory. Now also
So all of these lakes that you that you see throughout this area are part of the Linger Finger sorry, goodness gracious, it's the Finger Lake system. And uh, they include both the shallow lake, Lake Bernard, which is close to the Fraser train platform, and then Summit Lake, which is over here to the left as well. And again, all of these are actually fed by glaciers, and they do include glacial silt and can create some really beautiful colors. You actually may see in some of these lakes through here that, uh, that still have quite a bit of snow on them. But there's going to be a hint of glacial blue along some of these edges. And uh, you will see that. So if you were to be up here later on in the season, there are times when you actually see that blue but throughout the entire lake itself. Now also through here, you would have the prospectors coming through. And even though it's pretty flat terrain, you get really high winds, also the lowest temperatures, which was negative 40 degrees. And that the, if I remember correctly, the uh, winters that the prospectors had come up here were actually some of the harshest ones on record. Stretch your legs and uh, yeah.
So half of that water actually goes down um, to Skagway and flows into the Skagway River. The other half actually flows through the uh, Tormented Valley and into the Yukon River. And this is actually where we're going to be crossing the physical, physical border between the United States and Canada. So welcome back to the good old US of A, everyone. Now you'll also uh, see another area that we have a glacier. It's not this one that you see right here to the right, um, but it's going to be the one just past that that has a really smooth area of snow, and that is covering the Carmack Glacier. This is also going to be the highest point that we'll get to today, which is 3,292 feet above sea level. And that's only 15 miles away from Skagway, or from the shoreline. So it kind of just shows exactly how Mother Nature it has really created these really tall mountain peaks. Oh look, there's a biker going up the pass. Oh, brave soul. definitely quite a few lines and turns uh, so hopefully we don't have anyone that gets super motion sick if you do just make sure you have your overhead air on because it should be working all right now you also may notice that we have a few uh, holes here on the side of the road oh look there's more bikers heading up the pass wow they're very brave souls I could I would rather go down through the pass than up it. Actually, I would just probably just throw the bike to the side of the road and start walking. <laughs> Actually, or just hitchhike. No, that's hitchhike is a lot better for sure. All right, but these poles that we have here along the side of the road are actually used by the snow plows that come through here. Um, because we do get quite a bit of snow up here during the winter months, and especially this area that we've been traveling through because it's a high avalanche area. And the saying goes, white is right, red is dead, because the strips above show where the edge of the road is. The white shows where the edge is, the red shows where they should not be snowing or snow plowing, uh, because they're either going to have a really sheer drop off or rocks. But yeah, you do get to see some beautiful sights up through this area as well. Um, which again is just different from what you would have seen on the train. Similar, but very different. And the thing I do like about uh, these types of tours is that you actually get to see basically a 360 view of the entire White Pass. Because um, you get to come up one side by train and the other side you come down by bus. So you get to see both sides. something you would not have been able to see on the train ride either. But again, that's probably one of why it's my favorite, because I actually get to share it with you if the train does it. <laughs> but, uh, so again, we actually have a fault line coming up in this area that we'll get to see, because we have those two tectonic plates meeting here. And it has caused, you know, a few earthquakes here and there, you know, enough to uh, create a few landslides. But you'll see once we get further into this area that uh, there's a crack, or quite a few cracks actually in the mountainsides, that uh, 
come down the mountainside, go through the ravine that we'll be crossing over, and then up on the other side. And it's pretty remarkable, too. And you can also see on some of the bare rock faces that'll be right next to us, a few fractures as well that have come by the, those two tectonic plates meeting here within this area. <laughs> You can kind of see it if you were to look straight ahead of us. Though if you're further in the back, it is hard. I know, it's really hard to see through the front windows because you're all the way back there. But don't worry, you'll still get to see it. And if you look over to your left, you'll be able to see that as well as the William Moore Bridge. And another crack that actually has the William Moore Falls running through it. But you on the right, don't worry, you actually have one coming up here in, as we're making this turn. So if you look over to the right, you'll also see another crack in the mountainside close up. Actually how that, uh, yeah, so how it works close up. And it's actually really cool to just see that, um, and just see the evidence that there is a fault line here within this area. But this whole area basically is named after Captain William Moore, who was the founder of Skagway. He had originally come through here with William Ogilvy to uh, scout out a route for a lot of those prospectors. So yeah, we have William Moore Falls over here to the right. And another biker heading up the pass. Now, if you're not afraid of heights, feel free to look down and see how deep that ravine is as we're heading over William Moore Bridge. You'll also notice here on the right is where they're actually in the process of filling in the ravine. Now uh, they will leave some space at the bottom for that water to go through, but uh, they're filling in the ravine so then they could actually direct traffic over to that side as well. Because the highway was actually built in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And, the, and this is why I'm telling you this part now when we're off the bridge is the bridge is actually starting to show signs of wear. And so they are actually filling in um, that section so then the bridge can then be used for foot traffic and bikes um, just because, you know, things get worn down after a while. So, but that is, that is actually a really cool bridge as well. It is a, a cantilever bridge constructed such so then if the ground were to shift, um, cars could still get off, um, so, yeah, just because it's anchored to one side of the fault line. And I think there's only like 12 of those um, throughout the entire world, so it's kind of another neat feature. But you also may be able to see, if you look to your left and back a little bit, um, a bit of that fault line making its way up through this side of the mountain. And we have another biker coming up behind us. Oh my heavens. I was like telling you all about the bikers that were heading down the pass, but gosh, we're getting all the ones that are coming up. And that, this isn't even a tour group. Now also coming up here in just a moment as we make this next turn, if you look over to your right, you'll get to see Bridal Veil Falls. It will be pretty quick, just because uh, I really won't be able to slow down, so then we don't stop any traffic or anything. So, but keep your eyes peeled over to the right, and you'll see it really quickly. And that's actually flowing a lot more than it was last week, just, be, just because we have a lot more glacial runoff coming. And that uh, waterfall is actually fed by the Carmack Glacier. Now we're also meeting up with where the train goes through the pass over here to the left hand side. And if you remember Dead Horse Gulch is further just nestled into that small little valley to our left.
is pretty amazing just even coming back through this area just thinking back on uh, so yeah that waterfall back there to the right I think that's uh, just a temporary one due to all of the snow melt but you do get a few of those along the rock sites here too um, but it is actually pretty amazing to come through here you know a second time even and just think back on that what the prospectors would have gone through I'm so glad we have modern transportation nowadays too because man we can just travel in comfort in a big bus that's air conditioned thanks to that gosh and uh, we can travel pretty quickly too Just about. Oh, I think I jumped the gun a bit. I did, I did. Okay, so yeah, just about now is where you'll be able to see Pitchfork Falls. just past that is our pipeline that has maple syrup. Ha ha ha, just kidding. Dang it. The train spoiled it for me. Yeah, it's just water. <laughs> water that comes down from Goat Lake. One of the main reasons was so that um, those that were coming up for the gold rush could actually see, or they could actually differentiate which businesses were where. Since you had a lot of people coming up that couldn't read or speak English, because uh, they came from all over the, over the world, even from the lower 48, you did have quite a few that couldn't read English. And so having these different colors was a way to help them to differentiate which businesses were where. Now we're also going to be coming up to our booming financial district here on our right hand side. Our one and only bank here in Skagway. But it used to be the Bank of Alaska, now it is actually Wells Fargo. We do also have some lovely ladies calling out to the Bathroom Spy here to the left hand side. And they're actually advertising their, not themselves, but uh, stop. <laughs> but they're actually advertising the Days of 98 show, which uh, I know. I'm sorry. But the Days of 98 show actually. Um, talk is one that is featuring Sophie Smith and tells more of his story. Now we're also coming up to our hardware store over here on our left hand side, this kind of pink building. Their motto is if we don't have it, you don't need it. Because again, the uh, closest, bigger department stores that we can get to are going to be up in Whitehorse, it's two and a half hours away. And really, if, if they don't have it, you don't need it because they have a lot of stuff in there. And then also coming up on the left-hand side, we're going to have the mascot, which is kind of this uh, salmon-ish color. Um, and that was actually a very popular spot for the author, Jack London, to go to when he was here in town. And they Forest Service actually does have an exhibit in there uh, that you can go and explore. Here on the right hand side we have the Arctic Brotherhood building. That entire facade actually has 8,800 pieces of driftwood on it. And over here to the right as well we have the Red Onion which was one of the original brothels here in town. And they still do give tours. Just different ones. And over here to the left we have what used to be the old train depot and now it houses the offices for the parks service as well as our visitor center. And then we have two of the old engines that were used here on the White Pass as well here to our left. That first one is actually one of the old steam engines. The second one is actually one of the old snow plows that was used through the pass and could cut through 10 feet of snow. Alrighty. So, we'll just turn here, do a quick stop in town for ya. Just drop our things off and then head back into town. You can also take the buses 
the smart buses back into town as well, because they will have a stop just right past security. So. <laughs> Just a little bit. 